It's therefore now time for the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex for member statements. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Over a month ago, the staff at Pinery Provincial Park in the municipality of Lambton Shores was instructed to clear out law-abiding and fee-paying visitors and to put up barricades to close the park. Ostensibly, this action was taken for safety following a notice of repossession issued to the Premier and the Minister of Natural Resources by two individuals. This was after a court of law had already established there is no legal or historical standing for this land claim. The local ban, the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point First Nation, have been clear. They do not support this claim. Yet the park remained entirely closed to the public for weeks, and it is still closed for camping today. During that time, the Pinery Park lost tens of thousands of dollars in revenue. School trips to the park have been cancelled, camping reservations revoked, and people who want and deserve access to the park have been turned away. Speaker, this government has failed to uphold the rule of law. While they continue to have conversations with the individuals making the baseless claim, the rest of the community has been left in the dark. Anger and resentment are growing. I strongly urge the Premier and the Minister to resolve this issue and to restore the people of Ontario's rightful access to Binary Provincial Park. Open the park to the people of Ontario. Thank you. Closing member statements, the member from Hamilton Stoney, Hamilton Thank you, Speaker. East Stoney Creek. Today I'm speaking on two issues that are distinct but also connected. The first is the need to provide better health coverage for diabetics in Ontario. According to Diabetes Canada, in 2017, almost 5 million Ontarians have been living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Over the next 10 years, diabetes rates in Ontario are expected to increase by 44 per cent. However, since 2016, the Ontario government has not renewed the diabetes strategy that was once in place. This initiative improved access to essential services and supplies. It also included a registry to enable self-care. This was important to have in place, Speaker. As funding for diabetes treatment is reduced, the, di the disease continues. I urge this government not to play politics with people's health. Another piece of the puzzle to improving the lives of diabetics is lifting many of those who suffer in poverty so that they can afford many essential treatments that are unfortunately not already covered. This brings me to the next topic, which is Bill 6. The bill is designed to create an evidence-based commission to advise the government on what social assistance rates need to be in each region. This would significantly help all Ontarians living in poverty. Today, I'm proud to announce that the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, in partnership with various community organizers, is releasing a video to promote Bill 6 and get the legislature to move forward so that all Ontarians living in poverty have access to basic necessities. This is a huge issue in my area and encourage everyone to watch the video, especially the government. The Liberal government is holding this bill up and the clock is running out for all living in poverty. Mr. Speaker, we meet, need to move Bill 6 forward immediately. Thank you. Further member statements, member from Eglinton Lawrence. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I'm here to uh, speak about the silent, forgotten Holocaust, which occurred December 13, 1937, when the Japanese Imperial Army in a span of six short weeks, raped, pillaged, murdered, slaughtered, beheaded over 300,000 innocent children, civilians, soldiers in cold blood. They systematically destroyed a city, burned it to the ground, bombed it, and did unspeakable war crimes that have been not reported. Luckily, with the leadership of uh, my uh, colleague from Scarborough Aging Court, Sue Wong, and Han Dong from Trinity Spadina, a motion was unanimously passed in this legislature to honor the innocent victims of the Nanjing massacre, the 300,000 innocent victims. And uh, they hosted a, an event with 1,000 people in uh, Scarborough uh, last Saturday. Also tomorrow, more will be coming here to recognize and remember the Nanjing massacre in uh, cooperation with Dr. Joseph Wong and the Alpha Education Society. So we must never forget the Nanjing massacre, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
Further member's statement. The member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, in the spirit of the season, I am happy to share a story of generosity and goodwill from Perth, Wellington. Christmas is just a few days away, and local food banks are especially in need of support. As reported in the Stratford Beacon Herald, the Perth County OPP have been helping me to meet this need through their annual food drive. In Mitchell, the OPP uh, easily filled two cruisers with donations received on a single Saturday afternoon. Similar events have also been held in Listwell and St. Mary's. The goods will be donated to the Sal local Salvation Army to help families in need. They will continue accepting donations right up to December the 23rd and through their kettle campaign as well. Christmas is a time when many of us get together with family and prepare for the new year. But for many families, this time of year is a real hardship. They can't afford even the simple things we take for granted, a hot meal or presents under the tree. I'm so heartened to see people pulling together and giving to help the less fortunate. The Christmas spirit is alive and well in Perth, Wellington. Let's give generously. Thank you, Speaker. Member statements, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, I will table a motion calling on the government to eliminate wait lists for children and youth who need community-based mental health services. Speaker, there are 12,000 children and youth waiting for mental health treatment, some for up to 18 months. Meanwhile, children die or develop more severe problems. In Canada, we have the third highest rate of youth suicide in the industrialized world. We need action now because those wait lists and the effects they are having on our youth are unacceptable. In the absence of community-based mental health treatment, our children and youth often end up in the wrong place. Some end up in group homes where staff often have no training at all, let, in, let alone to be able to deal with complex mental health issues. Many who find themselves in crisis end up in hospitals, hospitals who are already in crisis due to overcrowding. Up to 50,000 kids in a year go to hospitals to get treatment because they have no other choice. The government can talk about the money that has been spent, but none of that money has done anything to ensure that kids get the treatment when they need it. Earlier treatment means lives are saved and they have healthier futures. With this motion, I want to cut to the chase so that children and youth with mental health problems get the help they need immediately. I hope all members will support it when it comes up for debate. Thank you, Speaker. For the member of statements, the member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in the House to discuss a private member's bill that I have tabled this afternoon for first reading on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder awareness in our education system. Entitled An Act to Amend the Education Act in Relation to Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, this bill, if passed, would amend the Education Act to allow and encourage school boards to increase their understanding and promote awareness of FASD and institute best practices to support students with FASD. The signs and symptoms of alcohol spectrum disorder are not always visible. In fact, many individuals with FASD do not have the physical indicators for this disorder and, furthermore, may not have a diagnosis. But these students need support, compassion and understanding from their teachers and those who work with them in any capacity. Over the last few months, I've met with many individuals from FASD networks and support groups, some with lived experiences, some who care for and or support someone with FASD, and some who work hard every single day to advocate on behalf of those living with th this disorder. A common theme I hear is that there is still much that is unknown about FASD. There are many myths and information about FASD that still exist, like the impacts of alcohol consumption while pregnant. Mr. Speaker, my private member's bill is a step in increasing public awareness about the risks of drinking alcohol while, preg while pregnant, but it is also about um, increasing awareness in our school settings. More collaboration between all FASD stakeholders needs to happen in our school system and in all of our facilities to ensure that these children have the ability to learn well in the future. Thank you. Thank you. For the member's statements, the member from Halliburton Court, Mr. Speaker, 
As we approach the end of 2017, I have been reflecting on the year-long celebration of the 100th anniversary of women having gained the right to vote in Ontario. Earlier this morning, I had the pleasure of being at Ross Memorial Hospital in Lindsay, which hosted an exhibition on the 100th anniversary of, the, of this his, history-making moment. The hospital partnered with the Victoria County Historical Society to shine a light on the World War I nurses from my area, some of whom were trained at Ross Memorial itself and who were the first Canadian women ever to vote. Over 7,000 Canadian women served as nurses in Canada and overseas at hospitals, field surgeries and casualty clearing stations. Alma Finney, who served overseas with the Canadian Nursing Sisters, or the Bluebirds as they were known, was the first among them to cast a ballot. Alma and her colleagues represented the best in the spirit of service and dedication, and it was fitting that they were the first Canadian women to cast a ballot. These nurses played an important role in Canadian history and deserve to be recognized and remembered as trailblazers who led the change that would impact women across the country. It was an important first step, and I have no doubt that they would be proud to see how much women have achieved since they cast their historic ballots 100 years ago this week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Other member statements. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Last Thursday, I attended a fundraiser for the Food Bank of Waterloo Region. A remarkable young girl, six-year-old Anna Pupolo, set a goal to raise funds. While I was there supporting Anna, here at the legislature, there was a debate on go trains. Speaker, after reading the Hansard transcript, respectfully, I say to you that it's time for a reality check. Building better transit is vital to my community. We're an innovation leader. Our Premier committed to all-day two-way GO train service by 2024, and we're on track to do that. Yet, unfortunately, a member of this House stated that we are, and I quote, getting nothing done. But here are the facts since I was elected. We purchased 53 kilometres of track between Kitchener and Georgetown, costing $76 million. We doubled GO train service. We are funding a $43 million transit hub in downtown Kitchener, funded a new $16 million GO train maintenance and storage facility, committed to a new GO train station and parking garage in Breslau, put $300 million into the new LRT, and just last week added another $25 million to the LRT when the region asked. And yet that member dismissed all of these investments as nothing. Not only that, but the opposition has consistently voted against funding all of these transit projects in my community. That member even attacked me personally, and to that I will say that complainers and bullies don't build communities. On this side of the House, we are planning and we are building better transit in Waterloo Region and right across Ontario. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this holiday season, I'm encouraging my constituents to shop locally. Today, I want to encourage everyone to give locally as well. There are an impressive number of groups in my riding working hard to ensure everybody is able to enjoy the holiday spirit. My family and I recently filled shoe boxes with necessities and small gifts and do donated them to the Muskoka Shoebox Project. This year, 1,092 shoeboxes were donated to women's shelters in the Muskoka region, the highest number ever. In Perry Sound, the Adopt a Senior program is entering its sixth, sixth year. Last year, 126 Christmas gift bags were distributed to vulnerable or isolated seniors. This initiative is made possible by collaboration between West Perry Sound District Community Support Services, the Perry Sound North Star, and Canador College. The Moose FM annual Christmas Wish Radiothon raised an incredible $100,587 for the Salvation Army in Bracebridge, as well as $35,000 in Perry Sound and $41,000 in Huntsville. The Salvation Army provides hampers and toys to families in need, as well as year-round services, including counselling and emergency housing. 
Around my riding and across the province, food banks like the Mana Food Bank in Bracebridge are seeking donations to support families throughout the holiday season and the winter months that follow. Firefighters and police often help collect food and toys. I want to commend the Burks Falls and area firefighters for their annual Christmas food drive in support of the Burks Falls District Food Bank. I also want to recognize the OPP Muskoka Georgian Bay Auxiliary Unit for their Stuff a Cruiser event, which filled nine cruisers with toys. Great. I encourage everybody to give locally this Christmas so that all can enjoy the holiday spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's their